So welcome everyone. Uh, today we will see uh, with Bram who will introduce himself afterwards after my my part to Nomad. So how to use Nomad to manage your applications, orchestrate applications. So I'm I'm Stefan. So feel free to to ask any question on the chat uh, and. If you want to tweet about this meetup, you can use the hashtag uh, Luxembourg Hug or and Ashikorp handle. And you can watch our YouTube channel Ashikorp User Group Luxembourg to find our previous recorded sessions. So let's start first of all with uh, some latest product news, as we did for every uh, sessions. First of all, Terraform, what don't you? implements an exception handling with precondition and post conditions. If you remember uh, in 0.13, Terraform introduced uh, custom variable validation. Here, preconditions and post conditions are an extension of these features, which runs a certain level of validation over input variables to check if they match uh, what's expected. In, in order to pr provide better validations for dynamic module inputs, Terraform 1.2 introduce preconditions and post condition blocks, allowing to capture assumptions in configuration and raise errors earlier and in, in, in context. That means that if uh, precondition or post condition uh, are not met, uh, an exception is raised with the message you, you put in the in the, in the block comment. So here, precondition and postcondition are not only available for validating module inputs, but as well uh, defining apply time checks for correctness. If the values are not known or until apply time, Terraform will do another check to the apply phase to ensure the condition are met. So here you see an example of these uh, postcondition blocks that validate a condition and the error message related to that. Related to Terraform, Consult Terraform Sync uh, uh, support now uh, directly Terraform Cloud Agent. That means that uh, you can enable the Terraform Cloud Agent support by configuring the Terraform execution mode per CTS task as agent. And now HCL Consul is now supported by CTS. For CDK, so the Consult Development Kit for Terraform to, to develop Terraform uh, modules with your uh, preferred language like, like uh, Go, uh, C Sharp, on, and TypeScript. Here, new command CDTKF provider add allow you to quickly and easily add pre-built and local provider packages to your uh, application. And the debug command collects relevant versions information and use that information to print helpful debugging messages. So it's now let's move on. Packer, Packer 1.8 introduce a new data source, HTTP. So when you can guess with this name, this HTTP data source retrieves information from HTTP endpoints to be used during Packer builds. And the new command Packer plugins command and subcommands is there to manage the external plugins. Because since the 1.7 version of Packer, the plugins are no, not anymore integrated inside Packer itself. It's internalized as, as a provider you can, you can know as in Terraform. And HCP Packer now is generally available. Concerning Consul 1.12, uh, this version represents uh, huge step forward to help organization to build zero trust security architecture. And first of all, for console and on Kubernetes, you can now centralize, uh, centrally store all console secrets within Ashikorp Vault, uh, rather than the Kubernetes secrets. That's, that that's, uh, implies that the, the secrets are encrypted at rest in Vault. Uh, in Vault. And the centralized, the centralized access to control to from Vault and the, audit, the auditing is available from Vault as well. Continuing on the 
consult on Kubernetes. You can now automatically rotate TLS certificate provided by Vault for all consult agents. This allows operators to reduce the, the TTL, for instance, uh, for their TLS secrets to improve, uh, enforce the, the security. And this release as well uh, make it easier to understand ACL syntax behavior and define least privilege access policy for ACL tokens. That means when a consul API request is rejected to a missing ACL permissions, the consul logs now provides de detailed information. You know now why the, the, the request was rejected and the console API indicates when the result has been filtered from the successful read request due to SEL, SEL policy configuration as well. So now, you, if you need, you can add the SEL permi token permission required for the, for the request if needed. For Vault, there are multiple updates, so uh, I will go through them quickly. Uh, login multi-factor authentication, uh, supporting uh, Uh, one-time password, Octa, Duo, and Ping Identity. This feature has moved from enterprise to open source, so we know it's available as open source version. Uh, Vault it could be, it could, be uh, could implement an IDC provider, so Vault act as an IDC provider uh, to let users leverage pre-existing Vault identities for authorization their applications. Uh, IMDB, uh, IBM, IBM DB2 uh, credential management is has been added. And database plugin multiplexing allow now for the database uh, engine, secret engine plugins to, to create a single connection to the database to reduce the memory consumptions. So the first database plugin that implements this is Oracle database uh, plugin. Um, runtime metric for Vault agent for authorization, cache, and proxy con containers have been added. Uh, server side consistent token is no uh, support greater control over consistent uh, model. PKI, uh, PKI get uh, hardware security modules uh, support, so you can now offload the, the crypto. Uh, to process to an external uh, security modules. Uh, auto key rotation for transit. You can now uh, select a key period rotation for the transit uh, key management. Uh, Vault usage metric has been enhanced uh, in this dashboard, so you can easily select uh, the billing period, uh, users, and uh, months months to, to, to select uh, the view you want uh, for the report. User interface has been updated, uh, and the secret engine and out method move. So if you want to remount the secret engine or the out method to some to another month, is easier than, than, than before. And you can move from another mount point and as well another namespace for uh, Vault Enterprise. So let's move on boundary. So boundary 0.81 and boundary desktop 143, uh, sorry, add the new health monitoring observability metrics. So this is Prometheus metrics, by the way. Uh, the audit event log uh, has been expanded. These features provide the full log of all events that occurs on the boundary clients. So that means that all connection to your internal server services are now logged into boundaries. And then you support uh, for the worker tag in the Amin UI to filter, uh, to better filter your resources in boundaries uh, UI. For uh, Nomad 1.3, uh, the main features uh, that have been implemented are nati native service discovery. So instead of installing a console to do service discovery, you can have a simple service discovery available in Nomad 1.3 without installing anything else than Nomad. So it's very, uh, by, um, <coughs> sorry, uh, the, the service discovery is a small part of console, in fact. The edge and reconnect workload support. So Nomad can deliver uh, workload in edge and by adding a new parameters that uh, That, su that support longer 
Health Check, Health Check Monitoring can uh, manage better the edge application. CSI is now generally available for NOMAD, so the container storage interface integration can manage external storage for Vault uh, now. So it was, it was experimental until now, until this version, and now it's generally available. Nomad pack improvements. So Nomad pack is like uh, N chart for Nomad. I would say uh, it's they improve the the capability of this Nomad pack to be used in CI/CD pipeline, and the new evolution UI has been implemented as well for uh, Nomad 1.3. For waypoint, a secret value for input variables has been added, like sensitive uh, tag you already know probably on Terraform has been added in uh, in waypoint. But as you want to know that this secret has been has been well propagated to your uh, target, uh, this um, sensitive value is hashed uh, in the logs to, to to control that the correct uh, secret has been propagated to your application. Uh, targetable targetable tar sorry targetable runners and runner runner adoption has been uh, improved. And the uh, instance count in deployment status report could be easily uh, retrieved. A new waypoint job command line can, can, easy, can ease the introspection of the job uh, application to connect directly to, to the job. So then last, the last but not least variant, uh, no updates since uh, last uh, sessions. So uh, Ashikar didn't communicate about the, the journey to Vagrant 3.0. So if you want to, to know more about this, if you're not aware of that, but uh, Vagrant will be migrated to go in Vagrant 3.0 version. But there is no communication yet from Ashikar about the progress of this project. So let's move on this uh, main topic of this session. Uh, so if you have any question as well on, on the product updates, I will share with you all the links about these uh, updates to go deeper uh, on what I, what I shared with you. So let's go to the main topic of this session. So Bram, uh, the screen is yours now. I will stop to share my screen and let you scratch, uh, share your, your screen. Hey, thank you, very informative, this update. Uh, let me try and share my screen. And I believe you should be seeing it right now. Right. Okay, no, I'll see that. That is okay. So yes, I'll do a little intro about Nomad and how, what awesome things it could do. Uh, first of all, let me introduce myself. I, hello, I'm Bram, um, or Bram in Dutch. Um, uh, I used to be a molecular biologist and according to my colleagues, uh, that's what I went to university for. Um, and then according to my colleagues, I slowly descended into the dark side, first becoming a bioinformatician and now um, also doing ops for the last 15 years because in an academic world when you develop you're just the the programmer person you're also the server person so you end up in doing installing a lot of stuff and that's how i ended up in, in operations i currently work at uh, as a cloud engineer at a consulting company in the hague in the netherlands where i'm based um, at a company called the factory and for the year 2022, I'm both a HashiCorp ambassador and a Nomad core contributor. And I'm also the hug organizer for the Amsterdam hug. Um, that's how I uh, got introduced to your little uh, nice um, user group. But let's, let's go into the subject of today, right? Your boss shows up in the office, or perhaps it already happened, so, but it's it's probably going to happen at some point in the, uh, very soon. And he says what they say, uh, let's move it all to the cloud. Right? Everything's going to be better. It's going to be cheaper. Uh, no more stress. Um, but for that, we need to actually have a look back in the past. Right? This is a 5 MB uh, IBM hard disk being delivered to somewhere. 
very important, very, and that's how you used to do it, right? If you wanted a bigger computer, you literally ordered a bigger computer. Um, back in those days, that probably meant that the building needed to be bigger. Uh, um, but uh, over time, computers became cheaper. So get moving stuff of, of making sure that you wanted something bigger or compute more, we actually came to a life where we managed to horizontally scale. So we could um, distribute our workloads across multiple servers, right? We didn't have to build a new building anymore, a bigger building to, to put that new 5MB disk in the, in the disk. That did mean that it, the architecture became a bit more complex, right? We needed a load balancer where we pointed our vanity URL to say myshop.lu. And at that point, stuff got distributed. You know, that's perhaps still where some of you are, right? We have a data center, we have a full rack, or we have a couple of racks with a load balance in front of it, or a couple of load balancers. Um, but if something happens, you're the person that needs to drive into the data center, or, or perhaps one of your colleagues needs to. So when we start talking about going to the cloud, it actually became more com complex because we, um, multi-cloud became a thing. Um, we don't actually own the hardware anymore. We don't probably don't even know where the hardware is located or we roughly know where it's located. Right? My, my primary customer is, is data is somewhere in Ireland. Uh, I probably could find out. But so far, um, Amazon doesn't tell you. Um, that's, and that makes life easier because you know hard disk dies, they fix it. Um, but it also makes our infrastructure a bit more complex. Not so much the infrastructure, the architecture for the infrastructure, because we need to deal with the fact that a hard disk might die and we don't get told about it. So we need to have multiple instances of everything in multiple data centers or even multiple clouds, right? Um, only recently, and I believe it was October, AWS lost an entire zone or availability zone, not even availability zone, a region, US East 1, um, which turns out was the global data center for a lot of stuff, including DNS. So that's why we are starting to talk about moving stuff to multiple clouds. And it becomes easier from a management perspective, but it becomes a bit more difficult from an architecture perspective. And you say, okay, move to cloud only started to uh, start be complicated, but that, it shouldn't be. And that's why the lovely people at HashiCorp have introduced a tool called Nomad. And I'm gonna introduce Nomad today by um, telling the story about how I moved my, uh, my personal blog onto a Nomad cluster. Um, if you want to know exactly how I did it, I have a five minute talk somewhere on YouTube that explains how you, why you probably shouldn't, um, but I used it as a, uh, a training vehicle for my blog, right? My blog is a one page static HTML page. Um, and today in this talk, we're going to build it up in such a way that we can, we can scale it or we can run it first in Norman, then we can scale it and then um, perhaps see where we end up and we'll, we'll introduce some more features. Right, so Nomad is the open source um, dynamic workload scheduling tool from the lovely people at HashiCorp. Um, the introduction today is gonna show you how to do Docker workloads, but it can do pretty much anything at the moment. You can do batches, you can do, as you say, containerized, but it does also support other container engines, not just Docker, but you could also very easily run Java applications directly. It has native integration with the console, with console and vault for things like service discovery and um, vault, uh, secret management. And it writes its jobs in something called the HashiCorp configuration language, which we're gonna build up on uh, during this talk. So let's deploy the blog, right? So I said, it, you have to write HCL and here we do a couple of things. We write a job called my blog, and I'm going to drop it into a data center called AWS. And it's going to be of type servers. There's a couple of other types. I can have a batch. So 
a service will try and be always on, a batch will have a natural end. And there's another type where you can basically say, uh, spread, give every worker node this particular job. And then I create a group called Hugo, because that's the, um, the tool I'm using to create my blog. And I set up a little network resource where I say my little blog is going to expose port 80. And then for the task, I say it's of type Docker. And then Nomad will look at what it needs to do for that. And that's the only thing I need to point to is my, uh, my image and to the port that I previously described. So I don't need to point to the actual number. I can just point to a handle, the HTTP handle, and then Nomad will start, um, well, know enough to start it. If of course the Nomad, the nomad um, client has enough, in this case, enough access to pull down my image, which in my situation it has. Um, when I said, of course, um, you know, we cannot be sure that um, Amazon, my EC2 instance is always up. So I need to have at least two instances. And that's a very easy addition to our little script. Basically in our group, Hugo, we say we need to have a count of is two. And then Nomad will try and start two instances. Of course, you need to make sure that you have a load balance in front of it. Um, but there are a very easy ways of doing that. For instance, a tool that I very commonly use is something called traffic um, that has integrated console into the, um, where you can just point traffic to a console service um, and then it actually does the DNS behind the scenes for you. So the other thing that Nomad does is it does bin packing. That's a very push word for it. Instead of spreading your jobs over as many nodes as possible, but it actually does, it tries to be as efficient as possible, which is perhaps a bit counterintuitive. So if I ask for two instances of my Hugo blog, Nomad is gonna schedule them on the first available client. So I'm actually not uh, protecting myself from this, this imminent failure. So what I need to do is I need to force it onto different hardware. And in this, for this, uh, Nomad has the constraint resource. And in this case, I'm saying, I need to, I need to have my job on distinct hosts. So spread them. Um, the problem with constraints is that if this other node isn't available, the entire job isn't getting uh, scheduled. So it will wait forever and ever for the second node to become available. So for that, if you, if you opt and choose to say, I want to, I always want two instances. And if my second node isn't available, use spread. So I, in, the, in this case, I can spread across two data centers because the data center is one of the metadata that the, the nomad has available. So I, I not only spread it across two, two instances, I've spread it across two data centers. Of course, spread, as I said, is a suggestion. So if this other data center isn't available, two will be scheduled inside my first uh, data center. And that's of course based on um, metadata. So I can also set custom data, uh, metadata. So in my home lab, I pretend to have two data centers. I have in his and in her side, because that's how uh, our home office is set up. Um, and in this case, I'm saying two of my my knocks are running on my side, two are running on her side. And in this case, this case, I can actually um, not only say spread them across to the two, but give um, you can give it a, a certain weight, a certain priority. So in this case, I'm saying his and her side all all have 50 50 percent uh, uh, priority. So it will be equally spread. Right, it's not like the duvet you share at home. Here's, here's a 50-50 between his and her. Um, and then you can have service uh, definitions. And this is how Nomad will announce 
how that it has a specific job running and where it's running. So since one dot three, uh, it was already introduced previously in the uh, the news update. So Nomad now has built-in service discovery, but previously you needed console. So in this case, I'm gonna say I have a service of name blog. And it's running on port HTTP. And what Nomad does is it checks if there's HTTP 200 coming back. And if so, all is well. And in this case, you need to specifically specify that the provider needs to be Nomad because the default currently is still console. And in this case, how do I use this service? Right Inside Nomad, it's very easy. There's a templating engine. And in the templating engine, I can say, in the range nomad service, because it is a range, because it, 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 in this case, it's multiple. Um, have a look for the address. And the address is something that nomad advertises for, some, for services. And it not only advertises the address, it advertises the port, and it advertises the, the complete URL, I believe, as well. In this case, this gets rendered out, and then uh, you can either use directly in Nomad or something like a uh, console template, for instance. Then Nomad Pack was already introduced. So before, um, there was a tool called Levant. Levant was externally developed by a community member, and that community member joined HashiCorp. Um, Hashi uh, Levant became a official HashiCorp product and basically was never developed further, uh, but there's a reason for that. So they developed Nomad Pack, which is, um, as introduced before, sort of the alternative to Helm Packs for Nomad. Um, there is a fairly active um, community registry already. Other registries are being developed. Um, but if you want to have a start or have a look at what you can all uh, put into Nomad, then the, the Nomad Pack registry is, is a very good starting point uh, to see what templates uh, or packs are available already. Um, it has a command line tool. Currently, it's very actively developed. So please, if you want to try it, try the nightlies. Don't try the releases because they're, they're pretty far behind already. And it allows you to use the Golang templating engine um, to create um, these packs that you can actually inject variables into very easily, because that's the worth of one of the problems for Nomad, right? This code, this temp, your job were quite static. So if you want to use them in CICD, you would have to set an awk your way around um, these template your what turned out to be template files. But now Nomad Pack is the actual way to go forward. How does that work? You basically, you have a look at what registries you have and you can actually register any, you automatically get the community registry, but you can also register your own stuff. And if you uh, wanna run something, it's Nomad Pack run and then the name of the pack. And there's a simple way of injecting variables. And you can make this very complex because Nomad uh, packs can inherit other packs. So you can very nicely create a pack for your database, a data pack for your web server, and then you combine the, the, all of it together in a sort of meta pack where you inject your variables. Um, if you want to try Nomad yourself, I have a, very, a fairly actively developed Vagrant setup. Um, where you get a Puppet Master, that's my config management tool of choice, um, a Nomad setup and a, and a traffic um, proxy in front of it. And now you can tweak and test um, Nomad yourself. It comes with a couple of jobs. It has full console integration and also has Vault set up if you're very interested in that. But Vault, I'm not going to touch today because that's, um, yeah, we're not going to have enough time for that. So talking about console, console is a um, the service discovery tool as developed by HashiCorp, and it does very cool stuff. And uh, what cool stuff can it do? Well, it so the service discovery, as I mentioned, it also has a built-in key value um, store. So you can store things in in console, and you can ask for it depending on where in what data center you live. You get the appropriate. Uh, 
answer. It also has a ser complete service mesh tool inside of it. Um, we're also not going to touch that today, but it's um, in the context of Nomad, it's going to make life quite easy. So what does my console service job look like? Um, it ha has the same two things as before. I have my name, my port, and the addition here is that I can build quite elaborate checks. Um, well, in this case, um, it's not as elaborate as, as, I, as I could go, but here I do basically a very simple TCP check. Is my port live? Yes, then my service is live. Um, so the beauty of this, um, they stole the exit codes from a monitoring tool called Isinga. So any if if there are any Isinga users or no Anagios users in the crowd today, you can recycle your Isinga checks. Um, right. And why am I introducing um, this a bit more advanced stuff? Nomad also has a way of automatically restarting your jobs, right? And in this case, um, I'm showing here is if it crashes, it will almost infinitely try and restart your jobs. Sometimes you want this most of the time that's actually going to pull down most of your system because there's a reason why it's not working. So I always say, please add a, a restart check. So here I say, I want to limit my normal job to three restarts at a 10 second interval and ignore my warnings. So if anything in the batch output suggests a warning, just keep, keep going. So after three, it's all done. And that's uh, perhaps I forgot to mention that that's all based on the console check. So if the console check gives me a exit zero, then it's good to go. But as long as I don't get an exit zero, I'll try and restart. Um, and you can actually um, try and restart um, with a certain delay. Right? Um, and that's pretty cool because there might be an external reason why my Nomad job isn't restarting. Um, this gives you a a couple of ways to restart. Um, it can, you can set it to a distinct interval, but you can also set it to, for instance, a Fibonacci sequence. So if you keep failing, the interval will get longer and longer, um, but I'll keep trying. Oh, that's actually this slide. So the previous slide um, sort of more introduces the uh, um, the notion of uh, delays. So I'll, I'll, I'll just the basic introduction of delays. So here it says, wait every, wait 15, instead of just trying, 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 it will wait 15 seconds and then we'll try. So here's the reschedule. So it will try and constant, every 30 seconds it will try, it will retry with an unlimited um, amount of retries. Of course, it makes more sense to give up after a while. Um, and of course, this is easy um, to believe it's going to work, but there's tools out there like dummy services or um, Shopify's uh, Toxy Proxy, which is very uh, interesting way of um, testing if, it's gonna, if your scheduling is going to work. Uh, same goes for updates. So if I deploy a new version, um, there is a way to manipulate how it's going to work. In this case, I say uh, when you notice there's going to be an update, um, do two in parallel and wait 30 seconds, 30 seconds for uh, my job to become stable. And this, this you can very elaborately build out to blue-green releases. So you can ask Nomad to start two new instances, make sure that um, they are healthy, and then do a swap. So if you're not particularly um, comfortable with 
one by one being exchanged because your code isn't isn't able to to deal with that. But for instance, you can do a nice blue green instance uh, by saying um, I want to do uh, I I want to wait for all my instances to be live. Basically, auto promote is false. Um, and wait for the, the new instance to be live before we, you turn off the old ones. If you do the other one, you can slowly uh, build up. So in this case, what changes is the auto promote is true. So it, it will pick one out and it will push one back in. Well, no, sorry. It will start a new one. If it's healthy, it will pick one and, and one of the running one out and stick in the other one. And that way it will automatically slowly replace one by one. You can control this by adding service tags, which uh, translates to tags in console. Um, and in this case, for instance, you have a V1, V2, so something that is produced by a CI CD, then you can start manipulating uh, your canary releases. If, um, and in this case, you can also um, use console to manipulate where traffic is going. So now we have tagged services and in console there's a way to send traffic a certain uh, direction. So you can control your canary test yourself. So instead of Nomad uh, controlling the sequence and the timings, you could control it yourself from within console. In this case, what here I show a little console blob of what you need to set to actually uh, do a HTTP header match so you can control what what uh, traffic is going. So it is a kind service router, and it matches a certain um, the the service and the uh, tag, which in unfortunately in configuration is called a subset, but it is basically what it looks like. Uh, what it looks at is the tags. How are we doing for time? I think we're okay. So the next one is the autoscaler. So we have a job, it's running, we have multiple running. Uh, we could manipulate traffic to it, but that's, um, you have to set the amount of running instances beforehand. So you sort of need to know what kind of traffic you need to have. And that's nice for some cases, but for instance, if you're running a, a web shop that does a certain specific offer or you sell the concept tickets, um, you need to have a peak uh, amount of, your peak traffic is a lot higher than anything you can start automatically. So for that, they've introduced the Nomad Autoscaler. It K was introduced in 0 to 11, so it's been around for a while. And just like Nomad Pack, it has an independent release cycle and it's still gaining um, functionality quite quick. And it allows for horizontal and vertical uh, scaling. So that's quite nice. And I'm, I'm going to introduce that today. Uh, so the, the autoscaling, um, you need to have three things. You need to have an APM, so something you can ask um, uh, questions about metrics you have collected. You need to have the strategy, and you need to have a target value. And the target value is how many instances I want to have running. And you can actually um, have multiple of these checks. And the answer with the most resources will always win. So if one check says, no, you need to go down in numbers, and the other one says, you need to go up in numbers, the, the latter will win. If one says, I need 10 instances, and the other says, nine, you're going to have um, end up with 10. Uh, how does this work? Still, still the same job as before, but now we have a little um, uh, autoscaler uh, section. And actually, this is what I do here. Is autoscaler can be run as a nomad job, and this is what I do here. So this is quite familiar at this point. I think we have a job autoscaler in the group autoscaler with the task autoscaler. You can see naming things is hard, and I'm not particularly good at it. Um, but I run basically the latest node in my autoscaler with the configuration that gets injected. And then in Nomad itself, um, I add a little bit more um, configuration. I point at my local uh, 
uh, Nomad server. I point at my metric system, in this case, Prometheus, and I set a, a strategy of target value. So I, I want to achieve a certain number of running instances. Uh, I already alluded to Prometheus a bit. It's the, uh, to me, it's the golden standard uh, metric system at the moment. It can collect system uh, metrics and you can query it quite effectively. It's a CNCF project that's been around for quite a while. It came out of SoundCloud. Uh, and you can run it in Prometheus. Uh, you can run it in the Nomad. Um, so why I'm introducing Prometheus, and that's basically because I'm going to ask um, for my blog, I want to have now this added section of my scaling resource. I'm going to say scaling is enabled, so I want to be able to scale that in and out. I says I want to have a minimum of one running at any given time, and you're allowed to scale up to 20, num to 20 running instances. Um, and how do I know how to scale up? We're going to basically going to ask Prometheus a, a question by performing a query on a certain metric that we've collected, and that's the uh, the traffic proxy, uh, what kind of traffic it's seeing. And I want to see every instance basically needs, can, in my case, be as configured to have five um, concurrent users at, at any given time. Um, how, yeah. This is all a bit black magic. So you can actually follow this on, on something called Grafana, which is a dashboarding tool that's been around since forever. Uh, it used to be able to only support uh, graphite, but it's, uh, it's gained lots of plugins and one of them being Prometheus. So what does our scaling look like? Um, in this case, we've started our jobs. Um, and it tried to achieve this, this in the block in the middle. It, we have about five connections. Um, so we have about three of our, we started the experiment with three running instances, um, but we only have five visitors. What we'll see is that um, Nomad will actually try and scale down to fit the, to fit do the, the query with the set. And you nicely see this here, right? We see it in the, the block on the top left, you know, group count, we've only got one running. And in the graph, we also see the count go down. Um, you can observe this in the autoscaler itself. It has quite verbose logging. And you can see that it's uh, picking up Prometheus. It's asking a question. And based on the answer coming out of Prometheus, it's decided to scale down. Um, and if we apply load, in this case, I'm using a, call, a tool called Hey, which is a load testing tool. And I'm saying for one minute, I want 30 concurrent connections. And in this case, you see that it actually decides to start scaling up, right? We see the, the instances go up to six, which meaning that the concurrent users per instance drops down to five. And if we remove the load, you see the reverse happening again. We drop down to one instance and a pretty much no traffic. Um, you can also use a lot of logging for this to visualize this even more. For that, I, I'm using a tool called Loki, which is uh, another amazing tool that came out of Grafana, um, which they advertise as Prometheus for logs. And why am I introducing this? I want to actually follow what is going on a bit more uh, deliberately than following little graphs going up and down, right? I, I can see them go up and down, but I don't actually know why the decision is being made. I want to actually see the locking together with my graphs. So for that, I set up, um, I configured the autoscaling group to actually start locking directly to Loki. And that's something you can do directly from your Nomad job. You can manipulate where the locking goes. So standard, it goes to a file on disk, which then gets read um, by uh, Nomad. But you can also start pushing it directly into uh, to Loki, which is pretty cool, which um, requires a Docker plugin installation. Um, so 
it's also a blocking in something. So you, if you, you need to be careful if you want to install it for everything. Um, but for the auto scale, it's very useful. I, I also, I now I need to also do a sidecar, which Promptail, which is their client. So it Promptail picks up the file on disk and then it sends it out to, uh, uh, to Loki. And yeah, it's a very simple uh, task. And this is a bit complex, but it's a configuration. Basically it says um, the bit in the middle is important. Pick up any log file that is in the folder alloc logs autoscaler. Sorry, in the alloc logs and starts with the name autoscaler. And then it sort of unwraps the log, the log file and then pushes it into a Loki specific format. Why, why did that introduce more complexity? Because Grafana can do something called annotations. So now I'm setting up an annotation um, called scaling actions. And what I look up is in these, these long log files, I look for something that is a scaling target. And um, what introduces this is a couple of things. So now you've seen them in the previous uh, screenshots, these uh, vertical light blue dotted lines is an event. So now we correlate um, the graph moving with actual events that we've parsed from our log files. Um, and this is something I added myself. Um, so now not only do we see the event on the graph, but we can correlate it to something that was produced in a log file from the autoscaler. So here in this case, we see um, the reason why um, Nomad autoscaler made a decision. In this case, it said my load dropped. Um, I prefer to go to zero, but you've requested at least one stay um, online. So we're going to go with the one that you requested. And in this case, you don't have multiple, need to have multiple windows open. It's all easily available here. And you can grow even, this is standard. The autoscaler scales in the existing amount of Nomad clients you have. But you can also set up, um, if you are, for instance, on AWS, but I'm showing you here, if you can actually grow into an uh, AWS autoscaling group. And this, this blew my mind when they brought it out. Uh, so in this case, the targets AWS ASG, an AWS scaling group, and based on another query that we're gonna, um, gonna write, it's gonna scan, um, it's gonna, of course, gonna first try and allocate it on the existing clients. And if the clients are full, and that's based on the query, it's going to add another node in your scaling group. Um, and in this case, the query becomes a bit more elaborate, of course, but it's basically the queries is long. You can probably ignore it, but what it says, if my CPU goes over 70% usage, add me a new node. And in this way, you can sleep heavily, happily ever after, even when the stampeding herds comes to your website. Or, you know, um, I know in Luxembourg, most people are in the financial sectors. I know, I've worked in banks before. And um, on payday, something, we knew something as the F5 herd, basically, is my, is my salary paid yet? Is my salary paid yet? Is my salary paid yet? And if you have a setup like this, it would automatically scale. First in your existing nodes, and then into um, basically how far your credit card is allowing you to go and without you ever needing to, uh, to scale things yourself. And this is what it looks like. It basically did another query. It came out with, um, in this case, my memory allocation was, uh, was filled up. Uh, so let's scale out and add another, another node. You can try this yourself. Um, the lovely people at HashiCorp have released um, these demos, complete, uh, both demos that I've shown today with the work I did. Um, and there's a couple of other demos if you have Nomad Enterprise. Uh, so if you want to try that, try it there. And that actually is the end of my presentation. Uh, nicely at the six o'clock mark. So I hopefully have shown today that 
moving to the cloud is doable. Um, it's totally controllable and should be very easy with the HashiCorp tools. So thank you, Brian. If you have any question, If you want to talk more with me, you can email me always. Uh, you want to yell at me at Twitter. My handle is, on most social media is at Attachment Genie. Um, if you want to have another look at today's slide, the presentation is, of course, being recorded, but the slides are, all, are already on SlideShare. And if you want to see me live or present more, I'm actually speaking at HashiConf Europe in about two weeks time, two, three, two or three weeks time. And I'll be discussing more of Nomad and how it can interact with Waypoint. That brings us to the question section. Can I speak please to have a question? Much. Thank you for the presentation. Oh, yeah, mainly, mainly I will get a, yeah, a look at Lokima, maybe. Open. Yeah, thank, thank you. Uh, you have a question, Remy? Or? No, only thank you. Thank you very much. And yeah, I will take a look at Loki problem, probably because I didn't know this right thing uh, for the moment. Okay. Great. There are probably questions. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm chat. I'm not sure you can see in the chat on my screen. Um, so yeah, Remy says thank you. Um, he's probably going to have a look at Loki, which I uh, yeah, I, I highly advise. Um, not sure what tools you have currently have. It's uh, it's a very uh, nice addition to uh, to my toolbox. Okay, if you want no further question, I will I will do some uh, updates about, about the next event on HashiCorp and we can do have an informal discussion after the session, after stopping the record. Okay. So I need to share my screen right now. Could you see my screen? So I'm not sure Stefan is talking, but I can't hear him. So let me check. Probably missed something. Yes. So the next session, there is actually copy up as a. Brand told you it's on June 20 and 20, 20, 20, 20 second. So it's in person in Amsterdam if you want to visit. And it's as well, you, are, you can connect to virtually. And all sessions uh, are uh, today scheduled. So if you want to have a look on specific products or more products on our, about Ashikov, you can go there. The, the talk afterwards is actually talk build. This one is more to understand how tools are being built by the, the, the developer. So it's behind the scene how actually products are working or have been built by uh, people around the, all the products. And the next uh, Luxembourg uh, meetup will, will come probably in September after the holidays. Period. So thank you for attending. So I will stop the record, as I said, but if you want, you can continue to have an informal discussion together. Stop recording. Stop recording.